This morning we will be in the book of Habakkuk. Habakkuk is another one of these books that seems lost in the shuffle of, of everything in the Bible. That It's one of those neglected, but I think that Habakkuk has such a, an important and a vital message for us. Sarah and I have some friends, and they had prayed and prayed and prayed for a child. And they found out that they, after several miscarriages, had finally gotten to the point where, where they began to feel safe. And one day they went to the doctor, and as the doctor did the ultrasound, he noticed that this child had a condition called anencephaly, where the skull does not completely form uh, over... The, the, the brain of the child. And he told our friends, Zach and Jen, what was going on and, and said that there was, was no chance that this, this child would, would be born healthy. But Zach and Jen, because they were so committed to, to life, they were so committed to the, the belief that God can do anything, they just prayed and prayed that God would heal this child, prayed that God would, would provide. And the time came and they gave birth to that child. And sure enough, as it was born, it only lived a few brief moments in this world. And there they held their dying child, knowing that they would have to bury it, knowing that they would have to wait to see it again one day. And you hear something like that and you ask, where, where was God? Some, a couple at my grandfather's church, Dave and Sue Clark were their names. They were one of the most active couples, one of the most faithful couples in the church, always there, always serving. Their first daughter was born and she had Down syndrome. And then they, their second son, their second child, Kevin, was born. And Kevin uh, was, was diagnosed from birth with this congenital heart disease. Several times Dave and Sue would go in to check on Kevin in the middle of the night only to find his little body blue. Uh, from, from a lack of oxygen, and they would have to immediately resuscitate him. And constantly we're dealing with all the, the health problems that that, that, uh, that presented. After they, they had their third child, they, they owned a moving company, and they decided to buy a new truck to help out the moving company. And Dave was driving this from Detroit, where they lived, down to Dallas, Texas. And on the way back was in an awful automobile accident. And he had forgotten to buy insurance on this brand new truck. And they lost their business. A couple months after that, Dave went to the doctor for a routine checkup. And the doctor came in and told him that they found cancer. Not only did they find cancer, but that it had already spread to the point that his liver had metastasized and only had weeks to live. You hear that and you say, where's God? Just... A couple days ago, I got a phone call, and, and a guy I went to school with, he and his wife, he was a pastor back in Kentucky, he and his wife had adopted six, uh, had, had six children, most of them adopted. And his wife developed some sort of neurological condition that, for lack of a better term, made her go crazy. And she said she wanted nothing to do with him. She said she wanted nothing to do with the ministry. And she left him with these six kids and went and pursued this immoral lifestyle, and he's having to resign his church. You hear that, and you go, where is God? Perhaps you have your own situation in life, your own struggle that you're dealing with, and, and, and it's just one catastrophe after another. It's one calamity after another. It's one bad diagnosis after another, and you, you can't help but ask yourself, where is God in all of this? In the book of Habakkuk, it's a short book, but it's, it's, it's the prophet Habakkuk wrestling with this question of, God, where are you? See, he, Habakkuk ministered in the southern kingdom there in Judah, and he had watched God allow the Assyria to come into the northern kingdom and, and to wipe them out. And now they're in Judah. They were living as slaves. And Habakkuk had seen as, as King Josiah reigned, and he was the most righteous king in some time. But then Habakkuk watched as... Josiah's son Jehoahaz could not feel his father's footsteps. And where Josiah was a righteous and a selfless king, 
Jehoahaz was anything but. And Habakkuk sees what's going on on the world stage. He sees the ascendancy of the Babylonians, of the Chaldeans. He sees that they're rising. He's, he understands that Judah is right in their path. He knows that destruction is imminent. He's been living under the oppressive yoke of slavery and servanthood for a long time, and he is just tired of it. And he comes to God with this question, God, where are you? Look with me in the first four verses here of Habakkuk, as Habakkuk questions God. This is the oracle that Habakkuk the prophet saw. O Lord, how long shall I cry for help and you will not hear? Or cry to you violence and you will not save? Why do you make me see iniquity and why do you idly look at wrong? Destruction and violence are before me. Strife and contention arise. So the law is paralyzed and justice never goes forth. For the wicked surround the righteous. And justice goes forth perverted. Can you hear? Can you hear the venom in Habakkuk's tongue here? Do you hear the accusatory tone? Do you hear how mad Habakkuk is? Habakkuk is saying, God, why are you letting this happen? I look around and, and there is not justice anywhere. Where there is justice, it's a perverted form of justice. And the righteous are being punished and the wicked are, are, are gaining favor. God, where are you? Why aren't you acting? He charges God with indifference at best and inability at worst. God, I don't know if you can't do anything or you just don't care. And God responds, look with me here in verse 5. God says, look among the nations and see wonder and be astounded, for I am doing a work in your days that you would not believe if told. For behold, I am raising up the Chaldeans, that bitter and hasty nation who march through the breadth of the earth to seize dwellings, not their own. What God says to Habakkuk here is quite frankly astounding. Because what God says is Habakkuk, not only do I know what's going on, I'm behind what's going on. I'm causing what's going on. I am the one that am raising up the Chaldeans. I am the one that am giving them this power. Yes, Habakkuk, I know they're wicked. Yes, I know what they're going to do. But I am the one giving them strength. And Habakkuk comes back to God with another complaint here in verse 12. Are you not from everlasting? O Lord, my God, my Holy One, we shall not die. O Lord, as you have ordained them as a judgment, and you, O Rock, have established them for reproof, you are, who are of purer eyes than to see evil, you cannot look at wrong. Why do you idly look at traitors and are silent when the wicked swallows up the man more righteous than he? You make mankind like the fish of the sea, like crawling things that have no ruler. He brings them all up with the hook. He drags them out with his net. He gathers them with his dragnet, and he rejoices and is glad. Therefore, he sacrifices to his net and makes offerings to his dragnet. For by them he lives in luxury, and his food is rich. Is he then to keep on emptying his net and mercilessly killing nations forever? Habakkuk is furious. God, how can you use them? I, I like what Habakkuk says because I think Habakkuk's perspective is one that we often face. And he doesn't come out and say that Israel is innocent. He doesn't come out and say Judah is helpless and, and, and that there is no reason that they should be punished. But you hear what he says? He says, why would you support somebody to attack somebody more righteous than they are? Again, he's not saying that they're innocent, but he's saying we're better, we're not as bad as them. How in the world can you tolerate what they're doing? We're at least as not as bad as them. We haven't done as much wickedness as they have. They're worse than us, God. God, how can you do this? Habakkuk even accuses God of treating humans like worms. He uses this extended metaphor where he describes God's dealings with humanity as just a fisherman putting a worm on a hook and just throwing it out there for his own amusement. He says, are we just a game to you? Are we no better than worms? 
one of the things that we all realize and one of the things that we all experience is that suffering is part of the human experience. There's no way around that. We don't like that and people try and come up with ways to avoid suffering. It just doesn't happen. Suffering is part of life and suffering is something we all have experienced, will experience, or are experiencing. But what Habakkuk does is Habakkuk helps us to develop a theology of suffering before we enter into it so that we're not overcome by it. Habakkuk helps us think through how we ought to suffer and what suffering means so that as we experience times of suffering, we can respond correctly. You see, we all have these questions. What do we do when life doesn't make sense to us? What do we do when God's character does not seem consistent with our circumstances? What do we do when we say, how could a good God allow this to happen? When we understand what God is doing in our suffering and we understand how we can respond in our suffering, we can respond correctly. Here, here's the thing. So often we're just content to survive in suffering. So often we're just content to get through somehow. But God does not want us to get through somehow. God wants us to get through suffering triumphantly. God doesn't just want us to wade through suffering. God doesn't just want us to just sit and let it pass. God wants us to be triumphant. God wants us to, to, to be greater than the suffering. God wants us to be greater than our circumstances. And as we look at the book of Habakkuk, we see what it means and what it takes to get through suffering triumphantly. First thing we need to do is we need to wonder expectantly. If we're really honest, the notion of God seems brazen to us. You ask some people, would you ever question God? And some people would say, well, I would never do any such thing as to question God. And that notion of questioning God seems to violate this creator-creation relationship. To question God seems to, to demonstrate a lack of trust. It seems to be a faithless act. It seems to be something we ought never do. And so some people would say, I would never question God. On the other hand, there are some people, when you ask them, would you question God? Well, absolutely I question God, because their assumption is that God is somehow accountable to us. God is here to make things work the way we want them to work, and God is here to do whatever we want done. And when God is not acting how we think he should act, and God is not doing what we think he should do, God must give an account for that. But if most of us are honest... I think what we would say if asked, do you ever question God is, well, I try not to. But if I'm honest, sometimes I do. Sometimes I do ask God why. Sometimes I do try and figure out what's going on. It is important that you understand there is nothing wrong with asking God why. There is no prohibition in the Bible against asking God what's going on. Job asked God why repeatedly. And God never condemns Job for asking. Habakkuk asked. God's fine with us asking. But here's my question. See, the problem is not really that we ask. The problem is usually what we ask of God. The problem is, is that we usually don't just stop at asking God why is this happening. Sometimes, in times of suffering, our requests become accusatory, but sometimes the things we ask for, sometimes we ask for removal. Sometimes we say, God, can you take this trial away from me? God, can you take this difficulty away from me? Sometimes we say, God, I need relief. God, life is too much for me right now. This suffering is too much. This pain is too great. I cannot endure it anymore. God, would you please relieve the, the, the pain and the hurt that I'm feeling. God, would you please remove and relieve this, this angst? Or do we ask for revelation? That is, do we ask God, God, please help me see your plan in all things. See, there's nothing wrong with asking God for removal. There's nothing wrong with asking God for relief. But we only ask that after we've asked God 
what are you trying to teach me? God, what are you wanting to show me? God, how are you wanting me to serve you? Our goal in life, whether things are going well or things are difficult, is to glorify God. And the reality is that sometimes what God uses to help us glorify Him, sometimes what God uses to help us honor Him is suffering. Sometimes it's in those moments of, of pain, those moments where we are beyond our control, that is when God is, is using our circumstances to help honor His name. Our problem is our perspective needs to change. When we're in these times of trials, when we're in these times of suffering, our perspective is what needs to change. See, typically what happens is, is when we go into a time of pain, we wonder, how is this affecting me? And we say, God, this shouldn't go on. This isn't right. This isn't what's best. But we're looking at it from a very limited perspective. This is what Habakkuk's doing. God, why are you raising the Chaldeans up? God, why are you blessing them? God, we are your people. God, this doesn't make any sense to me. And Habakkuk is just looking at things the way he can understand them. Habakkuk is just looking at life the way it makes sense to him from, from a very limited perspective. Sometimes we get mad because what God does infringes upon our system of justice and our ideas of fairness. And we don't like that. We can't understand that and we rebel against that. What we need to do is we need to ask God for this revelation. God, to give us the gift of helping us see these trials, these difficulties from his perspective. Help us see what he's doing. We need to, to wonder, it's okay to wonder what God is doing, but we have to be prepared to wonder how God acts as well. See, we can't just be curious about what God's doing. We have to prepare ourselves to be in awe, to wonder how God chooses to act. God's plan is perfect. God's plan is best. I mean, think about it for a moment. So often we come before God with this accusatory tone. God, why would you let this happen? God, why would you do this? If I was in control of my life, I would do things a whole lot differently. Let me just ask you, have any of us ever really perfectly planned out our own lives? What makes us think we can do it? We come before God and we, we say, God, how dare you? You know, I tell people sometimes, I can't answer every question of why. People come in and we try and look for these answers. Well, God allowed this because, God did this because, and we try and find comfort in it. One of the things you have to understand is you may never know the answer why. And that's okay. Because the only alternative to God being perfectly in control is God not being in control at all. And this, this idea that, why would God allow this? I hear people trying to excuse it by saying, well, God doesn't know, God can't stop it. I mean, there, there's a whole movement of, of guys out there who say, God limits himself so he does not know the future, and that way we can't blame anything on God. What kind of God is that? I don't want to worship a God who doesn't know what is, what is going on. I don't want to worship a God who... Is, is not in control of situations. The only thing worse than a God, the only thing scarier than a God who allows pain into my life is a God who can't relieve pain in my life. And when, when we enter into these times, we need to wonder expectantly, looking to see how God is at work, looking to see what God's plan is and what God is doing in these times of trial and in these times of difficulty. But secondly, we need to wait patiently. <coughs> chapter 2 Habakkuk in verse 1 he, he gives God his complaint he said you, you treat us like worms and then he gives God an ultimatum I will take my stand at my watch post and station myself on the tower and look out to see what he will say to me and I will answer and what I will answer concerning my complaint I mean, you read this and you're like, well, this is sure big of you, Habakkuk. <laughs> you just get mad at God and then you say, I'm going to just sit right here until you give me an answer. 
we do the same thing. We come before God. We want to put God on our timetable. We go through these times of unexplained difficulty. We go through these times of, of anguish. Okay, God, show me why you're doing this. God, I kind of need to know now. God, if you could tell me why before I, I go too much further, it would make it a whole lot easier for me to be faithful. God, if you would just kind of give me a clue as to what you're doing, where we're going, what kind of time frame we're looking at, would, it would make obedience a whole lot easier for me. We want our answers and we want what we want and we want our answers when we want them. But you know what's so remarkable to me about the book of, of Habakkuk? It's not that Habakkuk asks questions. It's that God answers them. This to me is a spectacular thing that God is so, so moved. God is so caring for his creation that though he doesn't have to give explanation, though he doesn't have to say anything, God chooses to answer. God chooses to be gracious to Habakkuk. Habakkuk comes and levels all sorts of accusations against God. And God very lovingly and graciously answers them. You see, God doesn't always act on our timetable. Sometimes God makes us wait for answers. We don't like that. Waiting is so antithetical to the way we live. We are a microwave society. We like fast food. We like express checkouts. We like pay at the pump. We like TV dinners. We like to flip commercials during television shows. We like short movies. We, we don't like to sit and wait. we got a short attention span. And one of the ways God disciples us, one of the ways God trains us, one of the ways he helps us is by making us wait to understand what he's doing. One of the ways that God, God helps us is by not just giving us what we want when we want it. To help us grow in patience. See, we have no control over having to wait. But we can choose how we wait. We can wait with the spirit of rebellion. That is, we can say, God, I'm not doing anything. I'm not going to church. I'm not helping anybody out. I'm not going to be a blessing to anybody until you help me figure out what's going on in my life. We can spend this time of waiting for God's answers. We can spend this time by just rebelling against him, by being mad at him, by by, by bawling our fists and just rebelling against everything about him. Sometimes we can wait, we choose to wait with the spirit of resignation. We do the adolescent teenager thing where we just, whatever, whatever. I don't care, God, you just do whatever. I'm, not, I'm just going to sit here and we don't do anything. We're not proactive, we're not moving. We just let God, we're waiting on him to fix everything. But God wants us to wait with the spirit of anticipation. God wants us to wait patiently knowing that he will answer and he will act. Now it may not be when we want him to. It may not be when we expect him to. But God will answer. God will act. God will help us see what we need to do. God will work and he will work mightily. One of my favorite writers is a guy named T.S. Eliot, the the, the poet, and, and Eliot wrote a poem after his conversion to, to Anglicanism where he, he really, he writes about this wrestling that, that, that so overtakes him as one who rebelled against God for so long and who tried to take control of his own life with this, this need to, to trust in God. And it, it's a poem called Ash Wednesday, and there's this refrain that goes through the whole poem Teach us, he says, teach me, teach us to set still. And as the poem begins to close, he writes, teach us to set still. Even among these rocks, our peace in his will. And that is what we as Christians need to ask God for so often. Just teach us to set still. Teach us to have peace in your will. Teach us 
to look and anticipate what you're going to do and how you're going to work. And when times come, help us to be patient. Help us to wait on your timing. Don't, don't let us try and force you into our box and force you into thinking what you should do and how you should act and when you, you should. And don't let us judge God based on whether or not He does what we expect, but help us to be patient. Help us to wait and watch and want His plan to unfold perfectly and us to be a part of that. You've probably never thought of, of the Epicurean paradox by that name before. But it's something we all wrestle with. Epicurus was a, a philosopher and he said, basically, we have one of two options in life when we think of, of these times. He says, either God wants to abolish evil and cannot, or he can but does not want to. If he wants to but cannot, he is impotent. If he can but does not want to, he is wicked. And, and you hear this question asked, and this even is, is so much of, of, of what's underlying Habakkuk's complaint. And You and I have probably thought these things before. But there's a third option there, and that is that God is in control. We just can't see it yet. God is at work. We just don't know how he's doing it. And God is powerful. And God can abolish evil. And God will stop things. We just don't see how he's at work. And so we need to pray for patience in our lives. For us to sit and us to anticipate how God is going to act. See, we need to be patient. But finally, we need to worship joyfully. After two questions... All Habakkuk can do is rejoice. Look in, in chapter 3 and verse 2. Or let's just look in verse 1. A prayer of Habakkuk, the prophet, according to Shiganoth. O Lord, I have heard the report of you and your work. O Lord, do I fear. In the midst of the years, revive it. In the midst of the years, make it known. In wrath, remember mercy. Do you hear what Habakkuk is doing? Habakkuk is taking his eyes off his circumstances and he puts his eyes on his Savior. Habakkuk is done asking why. He's done asking for reasons. He's done asking for, for relief. Habakkuk is praying at this point for revival. In the midst of the years, revive it. In the midst of the years, make it known. In wrath, remember mercy. Habakkuk stops asking why because Habakkuk has this glimpse of God that reminds him God is in control of all things at all times. Nothing is beyond his control. And Habakkuk is able to find hope and Habakkuk is able to find peace because he just is content knowing that God is in control, that God is on his throne. And though there may be pain in his life and though there may be suffering and though things may happen that Habakkuk cannot deal with, God is God, and Habakkuk changes his perspective. See, Habakkuk is reminded that God's purposes involve us, but they don't revolve around us. That's what we want. We want God to consult with us. We want God to say, now here's what I'm going to do in your life. Is this going to be okay? Will, will, will you like this? Will this work for you? God's purposes don't revolve around us. But God involves us in His purposes. God uses us for what He's doing in this world. And we ought to just be content. We ought to be able to worship simply knowing that God is in control. You know, the answers to why God allows things in our life, the answers of why God allows pain, they're legion. Sometimes God allows pain into our life like he does so often with Israel to call us back to him, to open our eyes to our sinfulness and, and, and to bring us back to where we need to be. Sometimes God allows bad things into our lives to mature our character. This is what James talks about in James chapter 1. Sometimes God allows bad things to happen to cause us to realize that our temple is a house of cards that he needs to destroy and rebuild. Sometimes God allows bad things in our life because we need to be reminded how much He is in control. Sometimes God allows bad things into our lives because 
we need to be reminded of how much He cares and how much He can comfort. I don't know the answer to why always. Can't answer that question. Sometimes God makes it clear. Sometimes He doesn't. But I will tell you this, it's rarely just one thing. It's rarely just a simple, basic explanation. God is normally doing many things all at once. But Habakkuk learned that the question of why is this happening is not as important as the question, how can I glorify God in my circumstance? We want to know the why question so much. Why would God let this happen? Why would God bring this into my life? Why would God do that? You may never get that question answered. But you know the question you will always get answered? is How can I honor God through this? How can I demonstrate His goodness? How can I serve Him? How can I live a life pleasing Him? Look at what Habakkuk says in, in verse 17 there of chapter 3. Though the fig tree should not blossom nor fruit be on the vines, the produce of the olive fail and the fields yield no food. The flock be cut off from the fold and there shall be no herd in the stalls. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. God the Lord is my strength. He, make my, he makes my feet like the deer's. He makes me tread on my high places. You hear? Habakkuk says regardless of what's going on, God must be praised. Things aren't turning out the way I want to turn them out. If, if I don't have all that I think I should have, if, if I lose things, if, if, if there are problems in my life, even though all that stuff happens, yet will I rejoice in the Lord. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. God is just as good as when our, everything goes right in our lives as He is when nothing seems to go right in our lives. God is just as much in control when we are happy and content as when we are scared and at the end of ourselves. God is always on His throne. God is always at work. And God is always to be praised. And there will always be an even though in our lives. There will always be an even though that will pierce our hearts and cause us to question God's goodness. Even though I am alone, even though I don't have any money, even though there's a stack of bills on my desk, even though I can't find a job, even though I don't have a good relationship with my kids, even though I've, my spouse left me, even though the doctor said I don't have long to live, even though... There will always be those even those that cause us to question God's goodness, that cause us to wonder why He is doing what He is doing. But we always need to come back to where Habakkuk ends up and say, yet will I still praise Him. C.S. Lewis wrote, his final novel was a book called Till We Have Faces, and it's, it's a retelling of the, the myth of, of Psyche and Cupid. But it's done from the perspective of Psyche's older sister, Orwal. And in, in the myth, Psyche is the most beautiful woman in all of Greece and is to be given over to a god in marriage. But Orwal, her, her older sister, is, is jealous of her and bitter because she's not beautiful. And Lewis writes this book from her perspective, and she wrestles with so many of these questions. Why would God allow certain things? Why would God bring this pain into my life? And she, she wrestles with that through the whole book, but here's her conclusion at the end of it. I know now, Lord, why you utter no answers. You yourself are the answer. Before your face questions die away, what other answer would suffice? And this is where Habakkuk is. God, you are the answer. Why? I don't know. But God, my life is to be lived for you. God, my pain is to be given as an offering to you so that I can use it to glorify you, so that I can use it to, to, to demonstrate your goodness. The, in the silence and in the stillness, God comes through with this I am that booms in our souls, that gives us the answer for why, it gives us the answer for how. God says, I am the God of your salvation. I rescued you. I saved you. I bought you back with my own son. 
God says, I am the God, your strength. You cannot do this on your own. Whatever it is you're going through, you cannot do it in your own strength. But I am here to rescue you. I am here to provide for you. I will carry you. I will lavish my love on you. God says, I am the God. I, I am your God. I am bigger than any problem you face. I am bigger than any circumstance that threatens you. I am your God. I am the one who is on the throne and I rule and I reign righteously and justly and nothing escapes my control and nothing is beyond my ability. I am your God. I know what it is to suffer. And when we remember that God himself knows what it is to suffer, that God himself knows what it is to experience injustice, our questions fade away. In Sheffield, England, a soccer stadium collapsed as a, a football match was going on. Hundreds of people were injured. Several dozen were killed. And people were being rushed out of the stadium, taken to a local hospital. The news was covering it, and, and it spread all throughout the city, but they had not released any names yet. And the crowd was beginning to form in front of the hospital. As people began to wonder if their loved ones were those who were injured in the stadium, or even those who died. And the job fell to a young doctor that he had to go out and would have to read the list of names of those who had died. And he stood there and he read those names very somberly one by one. And being a young doctor, not knowing what else to say, not knowing, he said, I don't know what to tell you other than that God loves you and God will be with you in this time. And a man from the crowd lunged out and he says, Don't you talk to me about God. God doesn't know what it is to lose a son. He does know what it is to lose a son. We're the reason he gave his son up. And when we go through pain and we go through suffering and we come before God and we accuse him, we hear God say, you sinned against me, and I gave my son for you. And there on the cross, Jesus suffered what you and I will never have to suffer if we put our faith in him. Because there on the cross, God's wrath was poured out on Jesus, and the father turned his back on his son, and they were separated in that brief but infinite moment. And Jesus bore the, right, the weight and the punishment for what sin brings. Jesus did not just experience a physical death on the cross, but Jesus experienced the wrath of God and separation from the Father. Why does God allow suffering into our lives? I don't know. But the reason we glorify Him in our suffering is because He came and experienced the greatest suffering on our behalf. And when we go through these times of suffering, we need to wonder expectantly. We need to look to see what God is going to do in our suffering. We need to wait patiently. We need to, 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 to wait actively as God is preparing to work and do great things for the sake of his name. But we need to worship joyfully because we serve a God who does not abandon us, who does not leave us, but a God who loved us so much that he gave his son to suffer on our behalf. And whatever suffering he allows or brings into our lives, he is doing it so that we can know him better and so that others can see his grace through us and hear about his love from us. We need to be a people who are not overcome by suffering, but because we have a Savior who triumphed over suffering, we need to be a people who thrive in a time of suffering by trusting in our God. Let's bow our heads. This morning, and you're going through this time. 
you're going through a lot of pain in your life. You're going, you're going through a time where you're constantly asking questions. Maybe you need to pray. You need to just pray during this time that God would give you the right attitude, that God would give you the faith. What does God say in this? How do we respond? Just live by faith. We respond by putting our faith in Him. We respond by having faith that He's in control at all times, that, that, that He is trustworthy. And maybe what you just need to pray is that God would grant you the faith to trust in Him in this time of suffering. But maybe you're here and you've never put your faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And this morning you understand you need to do that. Maybe you're here this morning and you say, Michael, I'm not going through a time of suffering. But I want to commit to honor God when I go through one. I want to be used as a blessing to help somebody who's suffering right now. I want, I want God to use me to encourage them. Listen, we've got a number of people in our church going through really tough times right now. And one of the things God can do is God can use you to encourage them and strengthen them and remind him of his goodness. I don't know how God's leading you. But we need to trust in who he is and follow him, whatever it is he's calling us to. Father, I, I thank you that you are in control. Lord, it's a scary thought sometimes to think that you allow certain things into our life, but Father, you never do it without a purpose. You never do it needlessly. Lord, help us to see things from your perspective. Help us to try and, and, and honor you in everything we do. Lord, I pray for anyone in this room, anyone who's watching on on television, anyone who's listening on radio who is going through a time of pain and suffering in their life. Father, who has nowhere to turn, nothing, nothing else that they can do, Lord, I pray that you would help them. I pray that you would comfort them, that you would give them wisdom. Lord, I do pray that you would give them a little glimpse of what you have in store. Help remind them that you are in control and that you're at work. Lord, I, I pray you would be with us, that we would seek out those who are suffering, and we would seek to be a blessing to them, and, and encourage them, and, and just help be used by you to give them a glimpse of your goodness and care for them. Lord, I pray that if there's anyone here this morning who doesn't know you as their Lord and Savior, Lord, I pray you would, you would help them see that they have no hope outside of you, and that you have come to take away the greatest suffering that any of us have ever that we could ever experience, that eternal separation from you. Lord, I pray that they would trust in Jesus, that they would give him their life so they can live to honor him and serve him and, and take the free gift that he offers them of, of his death and of his righteousness. Lord, we love you and thank you for all you do for us. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand and let's sing.